Welcome back to Bright Ideas from Acuity Brands on Industrial Sage. Today we are discussing the art and the technologies of balancing people and the environment needs with lighting. I'm joined in the studio by Eric Gibson, the Director of Outdoor Product, and joining us remotely is Rochelle Rivers, the Director of Sales. Thank you both for joining me. Um, Eric, I'd like to start with you. Uh, we talked earlier about design considerations when designing with outdoor lighting. We said light output, uniformity, glare, are there other things designers need to consider? Well, many outdoor areas have requirements for artificial or man-made lighting mm -hmm. to both improve safety and increase general security of the area. Uh, however, most added lighting like this does have some unwanted consequences. One of those negative impacts is the effects that it has on plants and animals. Okay. Um, ultimately, it is the responsibility of the designer to go through and balance the needs between the people in the space that they're servicing as well as the um, beings in the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. And Rochelle, wh where do you see the biggest impact of outdoor lighting on its surrounding environment? So one of the key conflict zones are beaches along the southeastern uh, part of the United States. Mm. And so these are very big vacation hotspots filled with condos and restaurants and commerce. And it's also a key nesting habitat for sea turtles. Okay, let's explore that a little bit further. You're saying that the lights will have an impact on the sea turtle population? They actually do. So one of the main necessities for new hatchling sea turtles is to get from the nest to the ocean in the quickest amount of time. And so what the sea turtles do is they use the reflection of the moonlight to guide them towards the ocean. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you have a lot of artificial lighting lining the beaches, the sea turtles sometimes can get confused and go in toward the wrong direction and not towards the ocean. Right. That seems pretty serious for that population. Uh, how are we supposed to balance the needs of the people because they need lighting in those buildings and those spaces uh, as with, with the wildlife in the area as well? Well, we, we turn to science. Um, and in this particular case, biology can help us on this particular case because hatchling turtles they live in an environment filled with blues and green color and things like that. There's not a lot of red, so their visual system is adapted to that. Okay. So they can go through, their visual system detects blues and greens, but they are almost blind to a lot of the ambers and reds. Interesting. So that means that our visual system can see those colors, they can't. So as long as we focus the energy into the ambers and reds, that enables us to see and function properly, whereas the turtles are essentially unaffected, similar to infrared or ultraviolet for us. Okay. Right? It has an impact, but we just can't see it. Um, in the case, uh, historically, we've always used high-pressure sodium and low-pressure sodium sources. Right. Uh, there are the yellowish colored lights that you may see on some roadways. Um, those have very little blue light, so from a uh, turtle's perspective, this is essentially uh, non-functioning lights. Right, so a pretty good option for a source. Now, maybe not the most energy efficient. We've been talking about LED lighting. Is LED an option, Rochelle? Yes, yeah, so LED is absolutely the direction that we want to go for this technology. Um, and fortunately, LEDs come in a variety of different color temperatures, including amber and you know your reddish, orangish colors as well. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to protect the sea turtles, I would just have to get maybe a LED fixture that has that amber color Right. To it. That's exactly right. And, and there are two different types of amber colored LEDs. Uh, the first type, what I'll call, is phosphor converted. Mm -hmm. uh, most LEDs are blue LEDs, and those blue LEDs are then covered with a yellowish phosphor. The blue light excites those phosphors and it emits an amber colored light. Mm -hmm. That is the most common, and it's also very, very efficient, and it's a very stable uh, source. That's good. Uh, is, what was the second type? The second one is true amber, or some people call it limited wavelength amber. Limited wavelength amber is actually, if you think back, uh, some of you may remember the, uh, the yellow screens on the computers Yes. Uh, <laughs> a long time ago. So those were amber LEDs. They are pure amber LEDs, which is great because the wavelength that it provides is extremely narrow. So it's almost non-impactful to the environment. Uh, the disadvantages of using that source, however, is it's not nearly as efficient. Okay. It's uh, also not as stable, and as the temperatures rise, the light output actually drops. 
So there are trade-offs depending on which one you want to use. Definitely some trade-offs. So how do I decide if I want to use a phosphor coated or a true amber? What, what should I be thinking about? So in some places, it's actually regulated by the legislation that you oh. have to use only true amber LEDs. Um, Florida is one of those states that's kind of leading the charge in that way where they do not allow phosphor converted amber um, for fixtures anywhere near their beaches. But, you know, sea turtles, um, th this issue is happening from Galveston, Texas, all the way up to the North Carolina beaches. So if a designer or contractor is given the choice of true amber or phosphor converted, a lot of times they'll actually go with the phosphor converted just because it is a more efficient source, like Eric was saying. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned from Texas up to North Carolina, this is, this is a, a possible um, issue that you need to think about for the turtle nesting areas. Is there anywhere else that, that this is a concern? There are. Um, actually, a very common location is anywhere near an observatory. Okay. Right? Because okay. observatories end up, uh, especially if you have a significant amount of sky glow in the area, they have difficulty seeing through that fog of light into the, uh, into the stars. So by using simply narrow band amber sources, it's much easier for those observatories to filter out the um, obstructing colors and end up with a very clear view of the, of the night sky. Okay, so definitely a few different applications where this type of lighting would be required. Yes, definitely. And the important thing to remember is that Acuity Brands does offer both amber technologies, whether it's true amber LED or phosphor converted LED. Mm -hmm. And even on our website, we have dedicated cut sheets for particular products that are dedicated to amber. So just go to the Acuity Brands. We actually have a dedicated web page for amber lighting, and you can find all the resources that you need. Well, thank you both for joining us today. I appreciate all the information Absolutely. on lighting and its impact on wildlife. Appreciate your time today. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Please join us for our next episode. We are going to talk about women and their impact on the lighting industry.